Yeah, thank you, Simon. Awesome presentation. Uh, now, we, I have the pleasure of introducing our second presenter, which is Faisal Masood. Faisal is the Principal Architect and AI and Machine Learning Lead at Red Hat Asia Pack. He's a technology leader with 20 years, over 20 years of experience building solutions that bring value to the business and leading teams with disruptive high growth technology companies. He has a passion for strategy, team building and emerging technology. And he's a published author with Pack to Pub. And so Faisal's topic is tame your data with Trino. And with that, we hand over to Faisal. Thanks a lot. Actually, actually Simon. Simon. Are you able to pass control back to me, please, so I can give it to Faisal? Thanks. I'm madly clicking buttons trying to work out how to do that. Yeah, so if you go to people, trainers, and there's three dots on the right-hand side, you should be able to. I uh, know, oh I can do it. It's okay. I figured it out. I know what I'm doing. Okay. <laughs> Here you go, Faisal. Good work. Thank you. You, sh you should be able to share now. Awesome. So I'm sharing my screen now. Give me a second. Find out the right screen. All right. Uh, can you guys hear me and see my screen? It's taking time. To yes, we can. There. Yes, taming your data with open source. All right, so um, today we, we are going to talk about um, how you can work in a world where you have data available in heterogeneous sources and how you can uh, assist your data science team to have the right data uh, so that they can continue building with your model strategies. So my name is Faisal Masood. I'm a principal architect and a published author of the book. I think Mark already told about that. So I'll quickly go through around that. So I got the liberty and uh, took the Simon Scats approach and uh, built uh, one scenario on top of that. And the scenario is Simon chooses to use PostgreSQL database to store his cat's movement, which is on the right-hand side of the screen, you can see. But what if we are training a model uh, and there are multiple cat owners and they, have, they are collecting data in their own homes with their own hardware and their own uh, storage technologies. For example, left hand side, you can see one of the cat is using data, uh, some data warehouse technologies. One of the cat owners is using NoSQL DB. So the data that you need for training your, your cat movement with, may be available across a variety of sources. And the sources can be uh, complicated enough. For example, they have their own formats like uh, structured data, non-structured data. Somebody may have streaming data. And they have uh, their own protocols to work with. Uh, sometimes they have binary protocols like Kafka, and sometimes they have standard RDBMS protocols or even file protocol like CSV. So when you are uh, building your data science um, kind of team and then your data science uh, project, you will find out the the data is 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 distributed across multiple formats, and it's not available in a nice CSV file as you guys see in Kaggle. So we need to find out, uh, today we're going to talk about how we can work on that scenario and how we can bring on the data from multiple sources and simplify the consuming of the data by the data scientist team. Again, the data science data scientists, they are not developers. We are not expecting them to write Kafka code or NoSQL code or go through S3 and find out how to read something. So we need to give them a consistent uh, way to access uh, the data, which is available heterogeneously um, across different sources. And that's what exactly we are going to do today. So to come up uh, uh, with, with uh, how important the data is in the machine learning world is uh, Andrew Young is, the, is kind of the modern father of machine learning. And one of his slides has uh, been uh, shared in one of the conferences recently. And what he's saying that uh, the models that you see now, uh, like AutoML or maybe deep learning models or some uh, very high-end supervised models like random forest um, and decision trees and uh, so on. They are kind of good enough for normal problems that enterprises or most of the organizations trying to solve. Excluding Google and Facebook, which are the cutting edge, 
the normal enterprises like banks, your uh, your public sector, your your finance companies, and they're working on uh, the the model is is mature enough uh, at the moment to handle those kind of scenarios. But the problem they are not getting the value is because we keep our focus on the model instead of keeping the focus on data because that's a boring bit. So you can see in the bottom one, he's uh, Andrew is recommending now to change our approach from model centric approach to data centric approach. So we need to uh, find the right data, access it in, in the right form and push it to your model so you can model can be useful as we go on. Um, so we're gonna talk about one technology today called Trino. It's a rabbit in the middle, which will allow you to access data where it lives. So let me explain you what I mean by uh, accessing data where it lives. Once uh, in the olden days, or a lot of companies still, when we, when we want to consolidate data from a variety of sources, we say, aha, we're gonna use data warehouse. And did the data warehouse, it works that we write some extraction job that reads data from a variety of sources. We do some transformation on that and then load it from the data warehouse. And data warehouse become single source of truth for different consumers and different teams to use the data. The problem with this, uh, with this kind of architecture is there will be inconsistency in the data because right now um, the data has been created every second, every millisecond. And then the, the ETL job may give you uh, access to stale data because it may run once a day, sometimes once a week. So the data uh, version of that you copied in your warehouse may not be the, the, the exact real data that is available in the source. Because there's a delay between the actual source of the data and uh, ETLing it to the data warehouse. So the access to the, uh, the data that is stored in the data warehouse uh, may, uh, may be inconsistent with, with the data at the source. It actually reduces the velocity of the teams because the actual data changes is happening in the real world. It may not get reflected uh, onto your uh, data warehouse and that may create a drag into your machine learning initiative. So what Trino uh, is trying to do is you do not need to do ETL or ELT to access your data. Trino will access the data where it lives. For example, if it lives in your S3 bucket, if it lives on RDBMS, if it lives on NoSQL, it will give you access to those heterogeneous data sources and give you the real-time view of the data itself. But that created another problem because I don't want to learn 50 different protocols of different data sources. So Trino actually create an abstraction layer and give you SQL-like access to all kinds of data. <clears throat> so just can we go to the next slide? So to summarize that, um, Strino is an open source project. Um, so you can download and use it for free. Uh, it was initiated in Facebook in 2012. Uh, it is, is a highly performant. It means it's, it's horizontally scalable. So for example, if you want to read 200 gigabytes of data and run some calculation of that, it will not download all the data into one machine or one kind of process. It will, um, it will scale horizontally, process the data in a distributed fashion and give you the final result. Uh, it's flexible enough, uh, as, as I mentioned, uh, it can work with any, any uh, data source and in data format and will allow you to access the data via SQL. So SQL is a standard language that uh, lots of developers know, business analysts know about that language. So the bridge it's building, Trino, is kind of virtualizing your data and you can access all kinds of data in SQL. So imagine if your data scientists want to read some data from S3, they don't need to worry about S3. Just write an SQL query, get the latest and the greatest data from S3. If they want to get some data from Kafka, they don't need to understand how Kafka work and how the consumers and all these things work in Kafka. They write SQL to read data from Kafka. And same apply to RDBMS, NoSQL, um, document DB, files, etc. So that is the power of uh, Trino which give you the real time uh, data at your fingertips with SQL. And of course, because it's an open source, so there is no vendor lock-in. You don't need to consume data in Hadoop or you don't need to consume data in some data warehouse 
um, to, to, to make it useful for your data teams. So let's see uh, for, for the um, demo today how it works. So I have one data available in my S3 bucket. It's a CSV file and it has some customer records. So these are the fields in my uh, S3 file, customer ID, gender, senior citizen, partner, dependents, and tenure. So I have a CSV file in my S3 bucket and I want to query that. I have another record in my Kafka and each record in my Kafka topics uh, has this kind of a structure. They have customer ID, they have, uh, are they premium customer? Do they have credit card? Do they have debit card? So basically there are two kinds of data here. So you can see one is customer personal data, which is coming from S3 in a CSV format. And the other one is the products the customer has bought, which is coming from Kafka in a streaming fashion. Now there are two different data formats, two different storage engine, to different uh, um, ways of accessing data. Kafka has a binary protocol, S3 uses HTTP on top of S3 protocol. And what we're gonna do is we use Trino to read the data from these two locations, from S3 and from Kafka. Now Trino does not ingest the data in the old data warehouse. It actually goes to the source, read the data on demand, process it in memory and give you the result out. So it will always give you the latest uh, of the data snapshot that you have in your uh, in your original data source. So that's the that's the whole uh, whole point of Trino. Now, when Trino is uh, is an SQL engine, uh, we humans like to to visualize things. We we like uh, we are more uh, productive if we can see the data and do drag and drop kind of thing to understand uh, how the data is behaving, do the exploratory data analysis and so on. So another uh, open source tool set called Apache Superset, which is kind of a GUI to use the Trino engine. And in this GUI, you will uh, write SQL queries that can uh, run uh, as a Trino query. And you can even uh, build dashboards in, in this uh, superset where you can visualize the data, you can visualize the trends, you can try to do exploratory data analysis. So you can see the power here is irrespective of the data location format, a you data scientist can use a single view or single tool to access uh, this kind of data. So let's have a very quick uh, introduction of, of what's going on. So uh, you, can, you can see my screen, let me just make sure. Okay, so now this is my S3 bucket. So you can see I have a bucket called data. And this data, I have a, field, a file called customer churn CSV. So it's like a customer personal data, like uh, their tenure, their relationship status, um, et cetera. And the other information is available in a Kafka topic. So what I do, um, I log into my superset. You guys can see superset here. Superset is a front end for Trino. So here, if you can see, if I go to databases, I say, okay, I want to connect to a Trino engine. So I'm already connecting to my Trino engine, which is running on my Kubernetes cluster. And I can start writing queries. So I go to SQL editor. I see, for example, um, Let's start with querying. So I, the first, uh, can you guys see the screen? Yeah, okay. the, the first table is called customers. And this is the one is coming from my S3. So if I run the query on, on the customers, I can get the result back for my query. You can see here, all the data I get, like I have customer ID, I have gender, I have citizen, partner, dependents, tenure. So this is the data is fetching from S3 bucket in real time by an SQL engine. The second data set is available in my uh, Kafka um, system. And then again, so I'm running a query against Kafka. So this is again, there's no database involved here. Trino at the runtime, go to Kafka and fetch the information for me, you can see here. Right, so you can you can if you want to uh, see what's going on with the Trino engine, you can basically go to Trino um, Trino monitoring solution, and then you can talk about uh, you can talk about all kind of queries that I'm running here. So you can see I have three workers running in Trino. It means it's horizontally scalable. When I run the queries, it's distributed across multiple machines, or it can sc scale to thousands of workers as you go. And you can see all kind of uh, queries that is running uh, against the, the Trino system. So this is the one way of doing that. So the other benefit that I want to explain about is 
how about if I want to join the data from these, these two data sources and use it? So I can just use a simple query again. You can see the first data is customers. And the second data is um, the Kafka data. So they are the products data. And I can run a normal query around them and it will it will work as it is. So it will enable um, uh, the, my data scientist to capture all kinds of data uh, stored for, for the cats in a different formats and use them for their uh, machine learning training and all other activities that we want to do. That's one part that we can do from the SQL perspective. The other thing that you, uh, you, you it, it creates a problem is, imagine if you have 200 different data sources and every data source may have 50 different, let's say tables or uh, data, data schemas. How do you manage all these? How do you uh, make sure that uh, I can find the right data? I can see what's going on. I can see what's available and then I can write my queries. So Trino also give you a uh, capability to create your data catalog. So for example, if I run my catalog query here with Trino, what it can do, it can, it can give me, I have four catalogs at the moment. One is uh, the Hive, which is the S3. One is Customer Churn, which is the Kafka. And one is PostgreSQL, which is my SQL. I just uh, connected for some other demos. And this is a system catalog. So it gives you all the information uh, in, in, in catalogs. And then you can find out what schema is available in each catalog. So you can go to schemas in catalog name, let's say Postgre or Hive. It'll give you all the information here, right? Like for example, if I do Hive here, <clears throat> it will give you all the schemas available in, in that uh, Hive, right? And then I can check out all the tables allocated in that schema. So you can, I can run the query here. It will give me all tables allocated in, in that kind of schema, right? So if I do Hive.default, Okay, if I just run this query, hopefully it gets the data back. So you can see I have the customer's tables available here. And not only that, I can, I can run uh, more queries to find out what kind of columns available in my data catalog. And you can find out the, the name of the column, for example, the type of the column, the size, the buffer length, and everything uh, around that that comes in there. So that Trino not only allow you to, uh, to access all kinds of data, but also give you the data management in, in form of a data catalog. So this is one of the bigger problems in big data is how to manage the catalog of the data that's available across different sources. So Trino can give you both the solution uh, on top of that. And you can query them via Supercent. And the last bit is now, let's say if I run a, uh, let's say I build a query, um, which, is, which is getting all my customer data and the products they bought. Now I want to visualize that. So I'll just say, uh, I run the query here, for example, um, I click on uh, explore and it will take me to the GUI of, um, of Superset and you can run uh, like data visualizations on the existing data. So for example, I select a type of uh, visualization I want to do. So I click on bar chart, for example, right? You can select whatever you want here. There are like so many here. I don't know a lot of them. So you can see time series, you can see pivot, you can see bar chart, you can see sunburst and so on and so forth. And here you can say, um, let's say I have a bar chart and I want to see um, if, how is the distribution between, if the people who are senior citizen, if they buy uh, the income protection from my bank or not. So I can say the series is, is senior citizen. So I have two senior citizen, yes and no. And then I do a breakdown uh, by income protection. So you can see if they are not senior citizen, uh, they uh, have uh, more, less income protection. And if they have, uh, if they are senior citizen, uh, they have very less income protection here. So you can find different trends in your data itself. For example, if I want to say if people who has, um, who has dependents and how do they, for example, buy uh, the credit card, for example, right? So I can run that kind of query. So these kind of questions I can come up with and give me the answers visually. I do not need to go to a specific guy to give me the data, then I run the report on that. So as a business analyst or as a person who is making decisions, uh, your reporting uh, uh, things that you, you have to do with big data on a weekly or daily basis, you can automate all these. And people at the end who has the right information can run the report themselves by using this uh, drag and drop capability. 
So I'll go back again to my analytics engine. So that is the basic idea of Trino, which will help you uh, understand and manage uh, the different data and allow them in a, in a and give you a catalog of that. So you can um, you can catalog them. You can um, see what's going on and find and use the data as it goes. Hey Faisal, just from a, a model perspective, is that effectively building a a model based on all of the sources in real time? Yes. That you can query. Yeah, right. Yeah. So I understood it. Awesome. Yeah. So what it does, it creates a schema. So schema give you the, the kind of model of it. So its schema is available in this uh, local hive store. But the data it reads at the runtime and join them at the runtime and give you the output of them. Yeah, that makes sense. And then, of course, you can use that in various um, machine learning models, right? In various. Yeah, exactly. You know, like, yeah, what, exactly. Whether they're, they're um, what do you call it? Um, whether they need human intervention or not, right? So. Exactly. Yeah. And then and generally in the in the production machine learning, the data is never come from one place and it's always ugly. So there is a Google paper that says 80% of the data science teams time is used to clean and process data. Only 20% is there to build the model. Again, that was Andrew Young says we have to keep the focus back to data uh, to give the business value for uh, for our customers, so let's uh, a quick uh, in, like a summary of how to run Trino in production. So Trino, if you can see here, it has two components. One is the Trino coordinator, which actually does all the parsing, all the query uh, processing, and then the Trino workers. The Trino workers are the one who actually goes to the data source, get the data as per the plan submitted by Trino coordinator, and then give you the final result. And then workers can uh, horizontally scale. Trino can provide uh, uh, integrate with your single sign-on provider to do authentication. Right now, I've not shown you any authentication. And there's a, another project called Apache Ranger, which can provide your role-based access control to your data. Now, imagine I showed you three catalog, right? S3, Kafka, and Postgre. If I if they if the, the requirement is I can only access S3, and Scott can only access Kafka, and Simon can only access Postgre. How do you put that control in? within your uh, data virtualization Trino. So Apache Ranger is one such project. And again, Trino has a plug and play model. So you can have another RBAC um, uh, component if you want to. But Rangers on the open source will give you that capability to associate uh, the access control for a particular user to access particular data. And that's the way you're going to run in production. So you have single sign on You have um, access control on your data sets and catalog. And you have end-to-end -end secure encryption uh, as secure channel to access the data and access the result itself. So, so these are the, some of the, sorry, go ahead. So, sorry, man. Does that work for um, derived data sets? So, you know, you've got your three data sets back there and you're going to come up with something and that's a derived data set, right? That you'll then feed into a, an unsupervised model or a supervised model, right? So yeah. Does Trino and the other project, which just eludes me, does that does that work where you're effectively deriving a brand new data set from this underlying data set? Because you're going to take this and you're not going to re-query it every time, right? You're going to take a snapshot of that data set and then you're going to use that for some purpose, right? And that's what I would say is a derived data set. Yeah, so so if you use data processing, Trino can do that. For example, you can read the data, you can join them and run some uh, lots of function, Trino functions, for example, and then insert into an S3 bucket. You can just use insert, and Trino will insert into S3 bucket for you. That can become your derived data, right? Yeah, that's um, quite cool. lots of, uh, yeah. So you can do it via uh, Apache Spark. There is also a popular engine that can do data processing. So Trino is good for virtualization virtualization of data, right? So the, the problem it's solving is um, making the data always relevant, always up to date, uh, and give you a catalog of data. But if you want to derive data, you can use Trino, you can use um, Spark or combination. All right, uh, is any question? 
Okay, so uh, uh, Mark has a question: Is Trino analogous to Zetteris and Denodo? So it's, it's kind of a similar. Denodo is, is kind of similar thing, uh, but Trino is open source, of course, and it has a lot many connected to do, and it's horizontally scalable. I don't know what Zetteris uh, uh, it can do. Um, and the other question by on is what if the data is in s3 is semi structured example json format that's that's perfectly fine but uh, in fact i'm going to show you if you see the <clears throat> the data that i got from from kafka which is basically it's a json data so it can read the json format and give you the uh, give you the the columnar view of your your json Right. Similarly, the data in S3 is a CSV format. So they both are kind of un, uh, unstructured data, uh, especially in CSV format. Uh, and, and, and in Kafka, it is JSON. So, yes. All right. If there's no other question, I give the control back to Scott, maybe. That was awesome. I've got a million questions, but that's OK. I won't hog the floor. <laughs> oh, it's me, right? I've always got a million questions. Um, one of the one of the big ones for me, right, is you know you're obviously running a lot of this on Kubernetes, right? So, are you just seeing in your general travels? Are you seeing that uh, Kubernetes is being used more for machine learning, or what are you just seeing generally out in in the big bad world? Uh, it's, it's a great question. Um, so I think if you are people are on cloud, so they prefer cloud native tools like SageMaker, as Simon mentioned before, or Azure ML Studio, right? But if you if you are in a combination of like a, a hybrid kind of strategy in which your lot of data is, is again on prem because what we're seeing is with finance and, and public sector, a lot of data is not on the cloud yet. Most of the data is stored in the on-prem uh, data centers. And the reason is obvious because of uh, the regulatory requirements, uh, because of security requirements and so on. If you're running on-premise, um, I've seen uh, an uptake of Kubernetes-based solution. And because Kubernetes allows you to auto-scale as we go, not only for Trino, but also, for example, if you want to train your model, if you want to, if you need, I don't know, 200 CPUs and 50 GPUs to train a model, you cannot put it onto one machine or one laptop. You mm -hmm. have to spread the model training across multiple machines. And um, for example, TensorFlow has a TF job capability, which allows you to uh, uh, do distributed training for you. Similarly, Python has a uh, component called Dask or Ray, which can allow you to do distributed training. And they all use Kubernetes because it takes the complexity of scheduling, it takes the complexity of communications uh, out of the libraries to make the library simpler. So yes, a lot of team are using Kubernetes because of bigger jobs uh, needs a good distributed processing engine, which Kubernetes provides. So that's, that's actually very, I know you have to go, but I'm just fascinated, right? That's really interesting because I know of a particular organization here in Melbourne that did a bioinformatics uh, workload, shall we say, about 10 years ago in AWS, and they spun up about a thousand machines. Um, and this is 10 years ago, mind you, right? Like, you know, eight to 10 years ago, right? And they went absolutely nuts, um, worked out very well for them, obviously, but they took the approach they took was using that derived data set. So they did the initial data classification offline and then they fed that into, you know, a, a thousand machines or whatever it happened to be yeah. to do the mm -hmm. processing at the time. And that's why I was asking about that derived data set because you don't, that's an expensive process, right? And you may not want to do that um, continuously. Yeah, but I think it's like, yeah, but I think nowadays 
a lot of time you have to do that. I'll give you a question, uh, a good example. But before that, you know, like uh, the thousand machine thing, Scott, is now the hardware is like, for example, the GPU, right? Yeah. So uh, one of the model we were training, if we're using like, let's say 64 cores, it was taking like four hours. Yeah. When you move it to NVIDIA GPU, it was under 30 minutes. So hardware capabilities increased. Uh, so, so of course that will simplify your model training. But with the derived data set, well, I'll give you an example. Let's say uh, here in, in, in Australia, we all use Google Maps, right? To see, uh, to, to catch a public transport, right? And a lot of things, uh, one thing that Google transport, uh, Google Map used to show is how full is your bus? Yeah. So they build a model and predict based on time of the day, how full is your bus, right? They're not visualizing the data, right? Yeah. So when the COVID-19 hits, and you got a curfew, and if you open the Google map that day, on the day one, it's still saying the bus is 70% full. There was like two guys in the bus, right? So the real world changes a lot, especially in these digital days. So every time um, you rebuild the model, we really, um, right now we recommend if it's possible to refetch the data from the source. Because so there's a high probability. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry, man, that's a fascinating point. And what is going through my head right now? I mean, you're talking to me, right? So it's all a stream of consciousness. What's going through my head is, you know, I get what you're saying about refreshing the model more often, right? Yes. Absolutely makes 100% sense. Are you seeing in the big bad world then what, you know, people sort of lean toward one thing or another? Are you seeing that refresh training? What's the percentage of supervised to unsupervised models that you're seeing out in the big bad world, right? Because, you know, typically in my experience, and please tell me if I'm wrong, unsupervised is used for that data classification and supervised is used for other more specific purposes, right? So what percentage are you seeing across supervised versus unsupervised? So I think a lot of time, with, especially with the deep learning. Um, so for example, we're doing some supervised learning with the deep learning. So a lot of time we see supervised learning is good enough. For example, for the, with the banks, with the public sector, they already have labeled data available, right? So we, we go to unsupervised learning if we don't have labeled data available, right? So yeah. a lot of time is mostly supervised learning. It can be a combination of old school learning and the deep learning part. Um, but most of the time is supervised learning. But some new challenges, I'll give you one, one example that we're working with is um, when you go to, let's say you are, a, you are a customer of a bank and you're talking to an advisor in the same room. So uh, we have some NLP models around that and they capture the, the audio signal and convert into text and find out, you know, is a classification and your intent and all that. Mm -hmm. uh, so that is, kind of solve problem. But one problem that we're working with is the the mic that captures two different people cannot tell who is who, who mm -hmm. is advisor, who is customer, like who is talking. And we don't have any labeled data for that. So we are, so that will go into like um, uh, unsupervised learning and find out, you know, like uh, we, we do some cluster of their text and see and then predict, okay, this is belongs to the customer and this belongs to um, mm -hmm. the advisor. So that can one problem with un unsupervised learning, I think we'll be using. No, that's really good. That's awesome. Dude, I could I could ask you questions for the next six hours, right? So I'm going to stop. And does anyone else have any questions for Faisal? I think that's enough for one day, seems like. Yeah, so Mark had one that is, what's the biggest and most complex implementation of Trino that you know of? Um, um, so Mark, I cannot tell you the name of the customer. It's uh, it's in our North America um, continent. And they were using, I think, almost 200 node cluster. And every node has around six to eight vCPU, so thousand yeah. CPUs. Um, and Facebook is using it, so it's a Facebook project. So they're using it at, at scale that I, I don't think so any any enterprise customer will ever use. 
Yeah, okay. Interesting, interesting. Yeah, that's cool. I've got to put you in touch with some of the people I know in New Zealand. Um, thank you very much, Faisal. That was awesome.